I uh, did not feel secure when I went into Drunel Hall this morning and there were two bomb sniffing dogs outside. But I did show them this new DVD that was I got in my box, which is uh, Nonviolence Includes Animals. So it's this is incidentally it's from PETA, one of the organizations that we discussed uh, as having a somewhat ambiguous approach to things, and it is here if somebody wants to borrow it. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. Uh, to see it. Um, let's see. Today, if nobody is in my office around 1245, 1250, I'll probably leave because I have to go to San Diego this uh, afternoon. <laughs> Part of a whirlwind tour that's going on. So if you need to see me in my office hour today and you wouldn't make it by then, give me a call. So I'll hang around and wait for you. Okay. Um, sorry? Oh, you know, that also might happen. I don't have to go to that. <laughs> no, we haven't heard about that yet. Um, we're getting a wonderful turnout for the Meta Open House, uh, including a friend is coming all the way from Germany. So those of you who sent out emails to do the invitation for us, they worked. We have a few more copies here if you'd like to put them around or frame them or donate them to the Museum of Modern Art or something like that. Uh, and how many of you are thinking of coming? Okay. Okay, very good. Um, and tomorrow, uh, I want to be sure that you know about the event at La Peña, which uh, is going to be a presentation by someone from the MST, the uh, movement that we were talking about. And that's the last thing that we were – Saying you, you of course will be there, Amy. You actually have. Uh, does someone remember? I forgot to pick up the poster on my way. Is that seven p.m.? Does someone remember that? Well, anyway, it's at La Pena, and you can call them and find out. Um, yeah, I don't have it here. Also, there is an organization called the Friends of MST. Most very large local peace organizations <coughs> like Sarvodaya in Sri Lanka, which is very, very large and which is one of the few that I consider to be very well balanced between constructive program and obstructive program. They have friends of Sarvodaya uh, based down in Southern California. And um, here's a phone number for the friends of MST. Eight three one. In case you want to go into it further, or you're writing a paper on it or something, ask for Juan. Juan Reardon. Actually, let me give you. Reardon at Yahoo. That stands for yahoo.com if you want to find out more information on the MST. So the last thing we said about it um, – let me see if I can go there quite yet. Yeah, I think so. I've got to get back to two quick announcements. But the last thing we said about the MST was – and I had showed you that clip so that you could see – that they don't really have their act together when they are attacked. And they have been attacked a lot. Uh, last I read a number on this, about a thousand cemeteries and uh, landless workers have been killed. When David Hartzell, you remember, who was here talking to us a while ago, when he was at the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre, he was taken out to visit some MST camps and he saw people living by the side of the highway who had never even gotten into a camp, much less gotten the title to it. And those people are particularly susceptible to being attacked even though they're not doing anything uh, very obstreperous yet. And as you saw, they didn't know what to do. They throw sticks back. The police are calling them cowards. They run around. So I would give the MST uh, A, possibly an A+. plus. We'll have to think about that. Somewhere between an A and an A plus for a constructive program <laughs> and somewhere in the low D range for knowing how to deal with the actual conflict when it happens the obstructive part of the program, obstructive or the conflict management part of it. 
this is not to say that certain events haven't occurred where nonviolent principles haven't kicked in. Um, in one famous case, the police came to arrest uh, some men who were in a camp and the women just got in their way. I know a case very much like this that actually uh, happened in northern Mexico um, recently. But uh, the women just stood there and said, you're going to arrest the men. You have to arrest us first. And uh, macho though they may be, they – or perhaps because they are so macho, they felt that uh, arresting women was not their thing. And uh, they were defeated by that. So it's not that they haven't had some sort of visual, visceral experience that nonviolent interactions can happen. But nobody has sat them down and said, do you know what that was? It's called la no violencia. Here's how it works. Here's how you can en enhance it and institutionalize it. And because of – okay, here we have this – we talked about this in a positive light, the fact that the movement has developed entirely new grassroots democratic structures of cons consensus building and so forth. The negative part of that is you can't go in – and say, I have something I want to share with you and you get their attention. So we've been trying and trying. David Harso has tried. We have somebody who lives down there offered to translate my books. Uh, I've sent them emails to have people who come here. But it's hard. It's like a big spongy kind of thing where you can't get one message to them. At times I, I can see why President Bush said uh, it would be a lot easier if this place were a dictatorship. <laughs> As you remember. In, uh, during the gas crisis in the 70s, the, f the first one, um, <laughs> the, the warning sign which went ignored, uh, Soviet Union immediately cut their gas consumption by you know, 30 percent. Uh, similarly, overnight they stopped smoking. Why? Because you have Stalin says, "Niet, no smoking. The whole country has to stop. So. Yeah, I'm not in favor of this kind of system, <laughs> calling it nonviolent. But the flip side of that is when you have a very non-centralized system, it's hard to get even good information into it sometimes. So that's, that's their story. Now, uh, a couple of announcements more and we can get started. Uh, I mean, we're started already. This is all fascinating. I know that. Uh, there is an uh, outfit which has got this very interesting constructive obstructive program going, which is to rebuild homes on the West Bank and Gaza, because Gaza is a different story now, but rebuild homes in the West Bank that have been destroyed by Israeli military authority. And the first house that they're going to rebuild is the house belonging to this family, it's a name I can't remember, but it is the house that. Rachel Corey lost her life trying to protect. So you're all aware of that episode. This is a 24-year-old American activist from Washington State with uh, ISM, the International Solidarity Movement. She was standing in front of this huge, enormous bulldozer and it, uh, the, the driver just dr rode over her and killed her. And he actually passed over her and then he rever reversed and passed over her again. And uh, my guess is that this was a deliberate uh, murder because it was immediately followed by two other murders, one of an Australian and one of an English man who were both part of the ISM. And I think there's reasons to believe that this actually was a, an order that went down that killed those internationals. However, however that may be, this, this young woman lost her life and has become a martyr and a symbol. And the first home that these people are going to rebuild is that very home that she was trying to protect. The home is actually going to open on May 22nd if you're looking for a place <laughs> in the summer. And here's the point. Yes, there was a point and I am getting to it. The point is that the organization that's building these homes is whole, have, using a new technology to have a telephone conference. And the first conference will be May 2nd probably at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And there will be a panel consisting of uh, Professor or Dr. Iyad El Saraj, who is a well-known Gazan psychiatrist uh, who is very much in favor of nonviolence. And some American professor <coughs> that they've gotten from Berkeley who also has nonviolence as his subject. 
So those two people will be on that phone call and they're planning to have 500 people listening in and then calling in with comments and so forth. So I'm going to be giving you the phone number next week, but I'm asking you now you might want to block out that date, May 2nd, 9 a.m. Okay, so I, th I think this is a very good mechanism in a very interesting way. Uh, this is something which uh, suits me very well because it has that blend. It, it's a blend in two ways, really. It's a blend of symbol and concrete action. I mean, concrete, <laughs> ha ha ha, no pun intended, but yeah, literally. <laughs> And it's also very symbolic, of course. It's a concrete thing with symbolic resonance, which for me is the powerful way to go. Uh, and it's a blend of constructive and obstructive because they're building something, person needs a home, but also it's illegal to do that, so they're in their face. And this brings us to my next uh, little pre-lecture point. I hope some of you got to see that clip that Sami Awad sent out. It was very moving. Uh, and as I was watching it and actually getting pretty emotional, but I got that under control. Don't worry, I won't do anything embarrassing up here. Uh, but as I was watching it, it suddenly struck me we have a very interesting gray area here again for us to talk about. And we've gotten pretty good at these sophisticated distinctions. Okay, here are people taking the steel girder. Okay, for those of you who didn't see it, what's happened is – the town of Berlin has been having a regular, almost unbroken series of demonstrations to prevent the IDF protected construction crews to come in and build a the wall, which in that particular town is very illegal and cuts off the town from their agricultural land, which is devastating. Seventy percent of Palestinian villages in that area are going to be affected in that way. But apparently it's been spreading to other towns, other communities, and this is when those happen south of Bethlehem, which is handy because Sami Awad and the Holy Land Trust or whatever they call it now is headquartered in Bethlehem and he's the nephew of uh, Mubarak Awad. And so this is very nonviolent uh, heritage that comes in here. So they had this demonstration. They walked down to a part of the wall that had just been poured and they unstaked from the ground a huge I-beam, a steel girder about 15 feet long it looked like. And a whole bunch and they picked this thing up and they just used it as a battering ram and smashed it into the wall until finally the concrete started to break up. You see the rebar poking through and everything. And then, of course, da -da -dum, da -da -dum, da -da -dum, dum -dum, <coughs> over the hill <laughs> comes these IDF soldiers and then they get into this melee. So here's my question. This is a form of property destruction. Okay? Are we okay with it? What are the considerations we should be thinking about here? Okay, we'll start with you, Mike, unless if you, you okay, Mike. <laughs> okay, it's okay to burn down Nazi camps. I would not say that to an Israeli, actually. Uh, they're a little touchy on that particular point. Um, but you, what to, I mean seriously, what you're saying is if an institution itself has a purely destructive <coughs> purpose, then it becomes a double negative to destroy it. And so it's a positive. Uh, Andrea? The wall is property destruction as well because you're just taking the entire house. Yes. Yes. It would be self defense. You're protecting your own property. The, yeah, the way that's about how. I would put it. The, the wall itself is an incursion onto your property. It's, it's in a way – in a way it's your property. It's like when they were burning their uh, – in the uh, Indian freedom struggle, when there was a big boycott against imported cloth, they started burning – people started burning their trousers. They would take them off first and then, <laughs> and then throw them on a pile and burn them. And, and we decided that back then that that was not really property destruction. It was renunciation because it was your property. So this is what the issue hinges on here. Yeah. yeah um, I don't think there's a problem with it. But I think my problem is more with the fact that in the article it called it symbolic destruction. And I think it's yeah. not symbolic destruction. It's more like they yeah. are actually destroying the wall. And like to call it symbolic destruction yes. of the wall I think is sort of like false pretenses and it's problematic. It, 
that. Yeah, that's a very good point. I hadn't thought of that. But uh, to call it symbolic when you've got chunks of concrete falling out, it's, uh, it's, not, it's certainly not symbolic in the sense that, that we object to, that is only symbolic. It is a physical act. It's, what they meant is this in itself is not going to slow down the wall materially because the IDF will just come up and, and rebuild it again. But still, if you recall 1942, Gandhi wanted to uh, launch Satyagraha. The timing had come for that. But the British were occupied so somewhere in Europe with some other little thing had happened. Uh, so he decided to have a Satyagraha of one. So again, it, it was Vinoba Bhave who went out to do it and get arrested. Again, it wasn't going to shut down the regime by itself. But it was a way of saying, this is what we can do. This is our attitude. And we feel this is the appropriate action. But we're letting you off the hook for right now. So yeah, I think it would be wrong to call it symbolic in our sense. Shannon? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm very uh, happy with this discussion. It's we really have covered the whole exactly what I think we should try to get out of it, and and very efficiently. On the negative side, we're not too worried about it. I, I could think we can probably think of seven or eight acts of violence that are more offensive. And <laughs> these Palestinians trying to block the destruction of their own property with an illegal wall. But what Shannon is saying is while this may be the best thing that you could do in the circumstances, it's not ideal. Because for the and I'm going to take what you said, Shannon, and escalate it a little bit and say not just converting the object into some kind of constructive use, which would, would be ideal. I'm not saying it was possible now. You know, the Palestinians could not say, oh, we'll make this into a chicken coop or something like that because they just don't have the means to do that. But you know, because of time constraints, the best is not achievable. What they're doing is probably the best that was achievable. But ideally, you would want not only to convert the object but the people. So ideally, you would want to exercise persuasion, not coercion, so that they themselves would say, you know, the hell with it. We don't want to build this wall anymore. That's the best way. And the difference between being able to do the best thing and being able to do what you have to do in the circumstances is once again often one of time. You know, here's the wall. If they sit around and they, by the time they convince the Israelis not to build that wall, they will have starved to death several times over because of that. And you know, it's a lot. Concrete, as you may know, gets harder and harder as it sets. So <laughs> it's, it's good to destroy it now <laughs> before it's for a couple of years. So this leads – hold on just one second, Michael. My last – I had this thought this morning uh, I'd like to put before you, which is uh, we've been at this now. In some cases, you've been studying nonviolence pretty intensely for about a year. And for others of you, you caught up very quickly. I'm going to suggest that as a thought exercise – um, Melissa, there's a couple of seats right here. Um, I'm going to suggest is why don't we tackle what is probably uh, the mother of all nonviolent confrontations going on in the world today, which is the Israeli-Palestinian one. Because if it could get resolved, everything would be easier in the Middle East. Our friend Paul, who we're going to hear from in a little while, would not have to go back to Iraq if we could get that situation resolved. Because we would be then saying a whole new story to uh, the Muslim world. So it's a critically important conflict. And you could look upon it as a conflict that escalated all the way up to the top and got stuck. So it's just this endless back and forth and back and forth. No rehumanization is happening. It's life and death going on at this piddling level, you know, in terms of numbers, but it's still <coughs> life and death. And <coughs> so the situation there 
looks from the Palestinian viewpoint <coughs> about as hopeless as it could look. <coughs> you have very little international recognition, right? Where in fact, you try to have formal international recognition and a certain country – I'm not going to name any names here. I don't want to embarrass anyone, but a large country <coughs> north of Mexico will pop up in the UN and say, no, no, you can't even scold them. You can't censor them. You can't censure them. So there's no way of getting formal dec diplomatic recognition. Informal is very difficult also. Uh, so there was a, there's a group called If Americans Knew. And this group has studied media coverage of that conflict. If you are an Israeli child and you are injured, you are between 16 and 23 times more likely to have that reported in the West as would be the case if you were a Palestinian child. You know, and I'm quite sure that if you did a, a DNA test, both the Palestinians and the Israelis would prove to be members of the same species. But <laughs> the media would never know that. So that's perhaps why the Israelis have reacted with this very nervous twitch to the presence of uh, ISM. And they were planning to have something called a summer of love in Israel, Palestine that, that summer when those people were shot. So but anyway, conspiracy theories are not the point. But the point is we're dealing with uh, a conflict which probably looks about as hopeless as it can get. And I wouldn't have asked you this in the beginning of last semester. Last time uh, I met with Sami Awad in this country, he was saying, you know, we were giving him advice like, why don't you organize blah, blah. And he said, how are we going to organize when we can't even make a phone call? You know, we have no phone service. We can't go out of our house. Uh, there's a curfew. Even the basic infrastructure of getting some kind of a nonviolent movement going is very difficult or not present. So here's my challenge. Let's think over the next couple of weeks how we could go about solving that crisis. And to make our life a little easier, don't even bother thinking about what the politicians should do. Never mind. I mean, you might want to come up with a policy that you would present to them. But the fact is there's been a series of pretty good policies, any one of which would be better than what we have on the ground right now. So the question is not what should the is negotiating teams be talking about but rather how can we prepare the infrastructure, if you will, so that they have to talk about it? What would we do on the ground if we were A, a Palestinian, B, an Israeli, C, other <laughs> member of the international community? Let's, let's do some actual thinking about what mechanisms that might be. Of course, some of them will be not – relevant because we're not there on the ground and we don't know what's happening. So we'll have to just run that risk. We can do some background study. But I remember saying to Mubarak Awad that he shouldn't make such a big fuss about waving the Palestinian flag because it was just a symbol. He laughed. He's very polite. So he, all he did was laugh. But in fact, I was completely wrong because it's a defiant mechanism that's created a lot, a lot of energy and focus. And my not being there, I didn't realize that. Okay, did you still have a comment? Am I? Okay. All right. So what I'm going to try to do is in about uh, 25 minutes get through an overview of where I think the theory of nonviolence has come to. And then we're going to hear from our friend Paul on a variety of topics. Um, this last part of our course, this is Unit 5, in case anyone asks you. Your parents say, you know, <laughs> I'm, you're making good use of all this money. Say, oh, yes, Mommy, we're on Unit 5 in the nonviolence course. <laughs> if we're calling it nonviolent culture, and it really covers the whole thing. So there will be a certain amount of repetition, right? For example, in the reader, you'll be reading an overview of the color revolutions. We've already looked into those revolutions, what caused them to happen and so forth. But now, okay, reread that stuff from the point of view not just of what happened but what people are saying about it. You know, how is it being conceptualized? How is it being framed? That will bring us into the culture area. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the theory itself, or how, well, how we understand nonviolence today, and about how it fits into the great turning 
um, project, which is, you know, the attempt to conceptualize how we would completely turn this thing around and have a whole new culture, economy, and so on and so forth. And I don't think that that's the big picture and we're the small picture. What I think is that this is like a holograph, not like a photograph. In other words, if you pick up nonviolence and use it as a focus, you can get to everything. Similarly, if you pick up the economy and use it as a focus, you can get to everything. You will eventually discover if you want a just economy, you have to have nonviolence. But, you know, my thing is I start with the nonviolence part. I don't know why I just – because uh, I, I hated violence because I was the smallest kid in my school. I don't know what, what caused all of this, but this, this is my approach anyway. Um, okay, so where are we? Yeah. I'm going to try talking about what is the state of the art in terms of thinking about nonviolence and then we'll go into training and organization and things like that on Thursday. So as you know from reading my book and being intimately conversant with every paragraph in it, you are well aware. But it bears repetition that as far as the English language is concerned, the word nonviolence was introduced into our language in 1926. I know to you that sounds like, oh, that's a long time ago. But bear in mind that the word violence has been around uh, as long as English has been around. And uh, by another kind of contrast, ahimsa has been around in Sanskrit since the ancient period. So this is very important. Of course, the thing is more important than the word. We know that. But in order to grasp the thing, partly we need a word. We need a handle to get hold of it. So that's a very important development. Now, the way human beings learn and the way human groups learn is really not well understood. Human beings have been defined as that species that can learn anything. And I think that's true. I would say a human being is a species that can learn anything, but there's some things that it won't. And I wish it would. Um, in the Rhone Valley in France, there was a drought that lasted for a long time. It lasted long enough that five generations of beavers came and went. When the water – I told you once, once before, the, the water level in the Rhone was so low that they could not build dams for five generations. And then, lo and behold, uh, the rains came, the river rose, and the beavers immediately started building dams again. So how did they know this? You know, they did not Google it. They, they did not, you know, look up and take, take out their manual, you know, dam building 101. Uh, as far as we know, there is no little dam-shaped gene that goes around in beavers that says, here's how you build a dam. There's some mysterious way that those critters knew without being told after not doing it for five generations, this is how you build a dam. Um, and there are many, many examples of that kind of thing in uh, the animal world. Um, but what we've been emphasizing <coughs> here is because of the rapidity of the change, we can't wait for nonviolence to percolate up from uh, on evolutionary time. See, we're not on evolutionary time anymore because of peak oil and everything else. So we have to intervene much more consciously, much more deliberately. So. Martin Luther King said, we've got to put our attention on this. This is absolutely urgent. Um, and that's why I emphasize with the Utpor uprising in Serbia, it's one of the few documented cases where we know how they learned it and we see how they're teaching it. You know, they, they learned it with a, a piddling amount of money, I mean, piddling by their standards. <laughs> By, by me, it would be, you know, it's more money than I've ever dreamed of in my whole life, but it's a very small amount of money by military standards. Twenty million dollars or so, these students were able to learn how to do a nonviolent overthrow from mostly translating Gene Sharp's books into English. I don't know if I mentioned this, but my book is being translated now in Bosnia, so I'll be – of course I mentioned it. <laughs> how would I not mention something like that? Um, so we know how the information got to them. 
And we know that the same group in the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict has taken those very people and, and their lessons that they learned and put this into a group called Canvas and exported it to Uzbekistan and all over Eastern Europe. <coughs> For another example that we touched on last semester, we now know, although nobody knew it at the time, that the civil rights movement in America was strongly stimulated by the Indian freedom struggle. And not just notionally, but people came over here. People from here went there. People from there came here. Uh, and they said, here's how we do it. This is what you watch out for. Here's, this is what makes it work. There were far more people than anybody knew about that had actually done that. And similarly, the civil rights movement in turn now becomes a learning process and a throughput. And I think the reason that we have people sitting in trees in the Oak Grove today is partly because of that movement. It, has, it created an, a culture of resistance in America. It created – we went from radical pacifism into civil rights into this culture of resistance that we now have, which has been mobilized against the uh, WTO institutions and, and so forth. Now, having said all of these wonderful things, you do have to be careful about the learning. Learning has to be smart and not just imitative. Uh, some of you who were at the dinner party with me last night were teasing me because of my incessant reminiscences of the 60s. And I admit it is kind of silly, but there I am. Uh, so we had this wonderful movement in the 60s called the Free Speech Movement, the FSM, and it was glorious and went all over the country. But if you're actually here, you know that about uh, eight or ten months after that, FSM2 happened. Now, FSM, same acronym but slightly different language. It stood for a filthy speech movement. And what it was was people wanted to get up and use four-letter words on Sproul Plaza and they wanted the administration to give them microphones to do this with. And if they wouldn't do it, then they were abridging our, our freedom of speech under the Constitution. In other words, it was they imitated the mechanism but for a, a cause which was trivial at best. Actually kind of obnoxious <laughs> at worst if you happen not to like that kind of vocabulary. So you have this – it's not just the case that something gets happen, something happens and it gets noticed that it automatically will be learned. What we're also trying to acquire is the ability to see under the surface to the basic principles, relocate those basic principles in our setting and apply them in, a, in an appropriate way. Okay? So that is the name of the game. And I, I freely admit that there's some mysterious processes going on here. And, you know, it's like the punctuated equilibrium that they talk about in evolution where suddenly all over the planet species decide, uh, okay, now let's try fur. So we've done feathers. We've done scales. Let's go for, for fur. PETA isn't around to stop us. So, <laughs> man, you know, all the different – Continents, crit creatures are not in contact with one another. You can't account for it in the ordinary way by mechan mechanistic means. But these things spring up. So there is all of that, but we have to use our cognitive faculties in a very sophisticated way. Um, so as this learning picks up and you have more events taking place that are of a nonviolent nature, you're having more organizations coming into existence to foster those events and perpetuate them. And some of those organizations, but not enough, this in my opinion, it's starting to improve now, but not nearly enough are working on the theory itself and working on the interpretation, which means getting the general public to understand what just happened. You know, if you remember from the very beginning of that uh, Otpour movie, Bringing Down a Dictator, the first thing that Martin Sheen said was there was a war that took place and I bet you never heard of that – heard of it. I know that I didn't. It was an incredible, successful overthrow and nobody ever heard of it. So we're starting to strengthen that, that part. And as this is all slowly accumulating and growing, I'm reminded of something that I read recently uh, that, e, you know, the Wright brothers and Kitty – Kitty Hawk, New Jersey, got into this contraption 
and fired it up and flew this airplane for a few hundred yards. That was the beginning of aviation. People were standing around saying this is impossible. It can't work. Human beings are not supposed to fly. Sixty-five years later, we put a man on the moon. So that's why I say we are not in evolutionary time anymore. Things have accelerated very, very rapidly. And I would say that we're not at Kitty Hawk with nonviolence, but I think we're at the Red Baron stage. You know, the early years of World War I biplanes are saying, ah, rah. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's not nearly as developed as it should be. Still pretty romantic. And uh, what we're seeing, I think, is roughly speaking, there are two schools of thought in the world of nonviolence awareness. And at in actual fact, there's probably a lot of people who haven't thought this through, so they don't know which school they would come out on. But those who have thought it through seem to be in roughly two camps. There's one which I call the aspirin school. And they're saying, hey, this stuff works. So why don't we use it? And then there's the what I call the overview school, which is saying, hmm, I want you to notice the subtle distinction between hey and hmm. Hmm people are saying, what is going on here? This stuff seems to work and that says something about human nature which we didn't know before. So let's figure it out. And then the, the aspirin types and of course um, the the language that's usually used for that is strategic nonviolence. And as we've said more than once, it tends to be a negative approach. Take away the violence and what you're left with is strategic nonviolence. Whereas the overview people tend to be looking for a positive definition of what is it that's going on here. Similarly, the aspirin folks tend to say we can use it for this application without thinking about its applications to everything. Whereas the overview <coughs> people say, hey, this could be, as I'm saying, this could be the core of the whole new paradigm. Everything would be different if we would understand what this thing is, start to put it into practice. Um, okay. So principle. Yeah. Principle. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so there's a rough consensus emerging among the uh, latter group, the principal group, which is saying that uh, this is huge. Uh, this is part of a paradigm shift. It's not just behavioral. It's not something that you learn to do and then you go back to the same old, same old. Um, they are saying that life is way more interconnected than it appears. And they're saying at the very least. I mean some people are saying that life is a quantum reality. It's absolutely a unity and all difference is a question of appearance. So it's not to say it doesn't exist at all. Some, for some cases appearances matter a lot. It matters what you do and so forth. Whether you do cut down a tree or don't cut down a tree matters on our level. But there's a deeper level where everything is one in some way that our conscious minds cannot grasp. So since our conscious minds cannot grasp it, it will not be on the final. <laughs> I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time with it. And I think we can be – we can work with the proposition that life is much more interconnected than we thought. And it becomes much more easy to see that as soon as you start looking at the world beyond the material level. Because on the material level, it is not. Uh, interconnected very much. I mean, molecules bump into each other. They don't even apologize. They just go their way. <laughs> um, and w getting above that material level then, as I see it – now this is, this is – I'm going to try a new idea out on you and I hope you like it because if you do, then I can use it in San Diego this evening. And if you don't, then I've got to go back to the drawing boards. <laughs> I think that science is really starting to come on board. It's starting to be very useful and we can see this on now three levels. This is going to be a little bit beyond the presentation that I made at the beginning of Pax 164A. Okay, on the, quote, on the material level, the culmination of the human attempt to predict how 
we can account for human experience on the basis of the motion of material particles, that project came to an end uh, with the discovery that you can't. Because in fact, guess what? There are no material particles. There are intersecting probability waves of force fields or God knows what those things really are. But one thing they certainly are not are standard Newtonian billiard balls. Okay? Now, the fact that the project came to an end and it came up with a negative answer doesn't mean that people uh, immediately recognized the significance of this. A lot of people just go on practicing science as though that had never happened. I was deeply embroiled, mm, involved in a kind of conversation with nuclear weapons lab scientists some years ago. And uh, I said, well, what about quantum theory? And one of them said, well, you know, if I were driving a quantum, I would need a quantum mechanic to fix it, wouldn't I? Ha, 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 ha. And that was about as far as they were willing to go, folks, <laughs> with a discussion of the implications of quantum theory. So this is, you know, what am I trying to say here? I, I'm just trying to emphasize that you can go on practicing science as though M Newton was right and there's little black balls, little yellow balls. But on the level of people who think the um, implications of this discovery were absolutely world shattering. And so then we tried it again uh, with the biological sciences. Let's see how we can generate a human being with everything that entails from a fixed set of genes. And in order to do this, they calculated that they would need, I don't know, 340,000 genes or something. So I, somebody here from MCB can correct me on the numbers. But when the genome project was over, it took much less time, a lot more money. <laughs> the genome project was over. They came up with an astounding discovery, which they were all ignoring for the most part, that you cannot uh, build a human being on the basis of genes. Because for one thing, there's only 80,000 genes instead of 340,000. There's not enough information, no matter how you cut it. Even if you go down to the molecular <coughs> level, you cannot get enough information into those 80,000 packets. So we were barking up the wrong tree. Well, now most biologists will say, well, let's keep barking. They're paying us. We bark. <laughs> no, no problem. But some are saying, whoa, you know, then what does create a human being? And so here we get to the third uh, experiment, which is going on now. And I'm going to call this cognitive science. But I don't necessarily mean the cog sci department at Berkeley. It's a little bit broader than that. But all of these experiments that I started sharing with you last semester about human determinism and how human beings <coughs> are affected by their own decisions and how those around them are affected by those decisions. And here we really are at the beginning of what looks like an extremely exciting breakthrough. It, it looked pretty good. About 20 years ago they were calling it uh, psychoneuroimmunology. But it now looks with these new ma magnetic resonance techniques where they're able to map the brain dynamically so you can tell what part of your brain lights up when you have which particular thought. It's becoming much uh, – the field is really opening up. And I think people are going to be – at least people who are comfortable with this kind of thing at all are going to have a vocabulary for explaining that in the words of a famous bumper sticker, which I photographed in Tomales, California, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. It's by all accounts, my favorite bumper sticker. And that's saying a lot because I really – I like a lot of bumper stickers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the context of this breakthrough, I'm going to now you know, lay out a few – just a few simple points, what I think are the basics that – Nonviolent theory is groping its way towards, and this will be partly familiar to it, but part to you partly not. The, the proposition is that – now I'm thinking now of a situation of conflict or at least disagreement, okay? So that could rise to disagreement to dispute to conflict. Um, in every human being, there is a core of awareness of that interconnectedness that we were just talking about. You know, the person may be acting as if they had no such awareness, 
But no matter who they are, that awareness is there. Okay? There is strategic nonviolence, this is not uh, critical. But for the cutting edge, principled nonviolence has really been going to become part of the great turning, I think. This is absolutely critical. So no matter how conditioned the person is, no matter how blockaded they are against their own inner feelings, that awareness is there. So this all division then, all not just disagreement but division, is based on an occlusion of this awareness, right? I have somehow lost awareness of my connection with Samantha. So then I can come to the view that in some little way or some big way, my happiness could be furthered by making her unhappy. Don't worry, Samantha. This is not going to happen. <laughs> Just <laughs> taking you as an example. But that, that's how all violence unrolls from that big mistake where the person cannot contact their awareness of that interconnectedness. So enter the nonviolent actor or actress. And that person, in some very pertinent way, reawakens or deepens his or her awareness of that interconnectedness. And finally, that aware, this new awareness awakens the other person. That is basically psychological roadmap of how nonviolence works. Now, mind you, on the big group level, there's strategic nonviolence. You can corral people into doing things that they don't want. We've discussed many cases of this, you know, how we got Pinochet out of power, we got uh, Milosevic out of power, how the Iraqis got the British and uh, their own uh, sheikh out of power in 1948. You can force them out even if they don't want to go. You can do that. But to make a permanent change, you, you're going to want to do it in a different way. And what you're doing is you're expanding your own awareness. Usually it's not a very easy, not a very comfortable process. You go through some struggle to do this. It's, it's suffering in a way. And in doing that, that communicates to the other person or awakens them in a way which we have up to now not been able to document or explain scientifically. So let me um, close and I'm bringing right on to 1030 just by reading you a quote which I often have handed out on midterms as part of an analysis passage, but I don't have to do that now because I found some fantastic quotes for your final. I, just, I can't wait for the final exam. I'm really <laughs> <laughs> eager to give them to you. But I won't use this one. It's by Marshall Frady who wrote a series of articles on uh, Jesse Jackson. And in the course of that, he touched on Martin Luther King. And he said, King started from the essentially religious persuasion that in every human being, black or white, deputy sheriff, manual laborer, or governor, there exists, however tenuously, a certain natural identification with every other human being. This is exactly what I was just talking about. He's calling it a certain natural identification. That in the overarching design of the universe which ultimately connects us all together, we tend to feel that what happens to our fellow <coughs> human beings in some way also happens to us. You know, it can be closer or further away. What happened in Virginia affects us very deeply because it was, in a way, it's our demographic. Yeah. Uh, and so what also happens to us is, you know, people don't write sentences like this anymore. That's why I, uh, that's why I like Frady so much. So this is all one sentence. So that no man can continue to debase or abuse another human being without eventually feeling in himself at least some dull answering hurt and stir of shame. Therefore, in the catharsis of a live confrontation with wrong, which is called what in our vocabulary? Nonviolent moment, thank you, name of a famous DVD. Therefore, in the catharsis of a live confrontation with wrong, when an oppressor's violence is met with a forgiving love, he all oppressors are male in this paragraph. He can be vitally touched 
and even at least momentarily reborn as a human being. Wonderful language. While the society witnessing such a confrontation will be quickened in conscience toward compassion and justice. Okay. Maybe I will course web you this quote because it's just it's so good. Yeah. This is Marshall Frady. Is it right? Okay, Michael. I'm ready for the nonviolent revolution of the world. <laughs> Okay, this is one way or another. Come on up, Paul. This, this uh, gets right to our very life. <laughs> and I'd like to introduce now a new friend of mine, Paul Chappelle, who uh, has a military background. He has actually been on a tour of active duty in Iraq. And when I asked him if he was going back, he said, that's up to the American people. So he's going to talk to us about what happened in narrow nationalisms and also uh, how we can foster conservatism. Take a conservative to lunch this week. <coughs> oh, this is fine. Hi, my name is Paul Chappelle. I'm actually active duty in the Army. And I have a particular fondness for what I call peaceful democratic solutions, because that's what allowed all of us to be here today and have this discussion. If you look at this country 200 years ago when if you weren't a white male landowner, you had no rights, it really wasn't a good country to live in. But the fact that we're here now, men, women, people from different religious backgrounds, people from different ethnicities, it shows how far we've come. And that didn't happen through war. It happened through peaceful democratic solutions that have brought us to where we are today. Um, I'm a West Point graduate. I was actually a White House intern under the Bush administration. And I wrote a book, it'll be published early 08, called Peaceful Revolution. And I have a long history of reading Thoreau, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, all the major religious texts, Western philosophy. And you understand that nonviolence, or what I call peaceful democratic solutions, are very, very old. And they're very, very cherished in many cultures and many countries all over the world. But right now, our country is in a very turbulent time because people are divided. And we're divided along politi political ideology, we're divided along wedge issues. And unless we can come together across political boundaries, how can we ever have peaceful solutions? And I'd like to talk about how we can open up dialogue with people in the middle, people on the right, even people on the far right. I think it's a very realistic solution, and I think we can all do it together. So whenever you talk about the government or try to critique the government, people say, oh, well, you're un-American or you're unpatriotic. And so what I always tell people is, let's say you have a child. If you love your child, and you find out your child is murdering people or doing drugs or doing anything immoral or dishonest, you try to correct your child. If you don't love your child, you let your child get away with murder because you're just blindly apathetic. In the same way, if you love your country, then you want to make your country a better place to live. If you love your country, you want to make America a better place, as people did for the past 200 years, which is what it, uh, is allowing us to have this discussion today. So if Martin Luther King would have just said, well, I don't want to be unpatriotic, I don't want to question the government, or if Susan B. Anthony would have said, I, I don't want to be an American. I, I should just, just let things go. Where would we be today? Nowhere near where we are right now. And so 200 years ago, if you were a white male landowner, you had it pretty good. If you weren't, if you're Native American, Chinese, black, Hispanic, female, homosexual, handicapped, even Catholic or Jewish in many cases, it was a very difficult country to live in. We've come a long way through those democratic means that has made our country great and which our democracy is founded upon. And so <coughs> when my father was drafted into the army in the early 50s, he was half white, half black, my mother's Korean. The army was segregated. So governments make mistakes. Governments aren't perfect. They're elected and they're run by people. And so another thing we need to discuss with people is you need to differentiate between your government and your country. Your government is 300 million American people, the constitution, and the ideals of democracy. Your government's an elected few representatives who make mistakes like everybody. 
So if you want to be loyal to your country, you need to question and improve your government. That's what Martin Luther King did. That's what Susan B. Anthony, Mark Twain, Henry David Thoreau, Woody Guthrie, Helen Keller, all these people did this. And now if you do that, oh, you're un-American, you're unpatriotic, all nonsense. As Henry David Thoreau once said, I am not a no government. I'm not asking for no government, but it wants a better government. And that's what we all need to ask for. Now, <clears throat> when I was growing up in elementary school, we have government classes, and we're always taught about the checks and balances between legislative, executive, judicial branches. But what they don't teach you in elementary school, what they should teach every kindergartner in every grade, first grade through 12th grade, is that the most important check and balance of the government is the American people. The American people are the most important check and balance. Judicial, executive, legislative branches are typically reactionary. They respond to social and people's movements. And our democracy is founded upon Congress being subservient to the American people, the president being subservient to the American people. And since the military is subservient to the president and Congress, the military is also subservient to the American people. And that's what we have to keep in mind. When I discuss with this with people, they say, well, <clears throat> that's all in good, but um, right now we have a presidential candidate who's a female, Hillary Clinton. We have a presidential candidate who's black, Barack Obama. So everything's good. I, don't see, I really don't see a problem with what's going on. But what we're dealing with now is not injustice. We're dealing with our very survival. If you look at Eisenhower's warning about the military-industrial complex, which has unfortunately come true, and if you look at the environment, we're dealing with our survival here not just injustice, and the fact that people can't see that, it is our responsibility to help bring that to their attention in a way where we can unite people and not divide people along these wedge issues that really won't guarantee the survival and prosperity of the human race, hopefully for many more millennia. A way to go about speaking to people, I personally don't like the term nonviolence because it's the, neg it's the negation of something. To me, it's an empty term. It'd be like calling the ground the non-sky or a female a non-man. What I like to refer to it is as peaceful democratic solution. You appeal to people's sense of democracy. You appeal to people's sense of the reality that our democracy is founded upon the fact that we can make changes peacefully through changing elected representatives, through civil protests. That's what democracy is founded upon. So nonviolence, if you say that term, people, they don't understand what it means. Just like if you said non-ground, I don't know if you're talking about the sky, I don't know if you're talking about trees, I don't know really what you're talking about. But if you talk about peaceful democratic solutions and how that has made our country great, you really appeal to what I believe most Americans have, and that is a respect for the values of democracy. And if you look at how we're driven into narrow nationalism, it's typically, well, we have to protect the democracy. And people are trying to destroy our democracy. That's why you have to be nationalistic. If you're not nationalistic, then America will be taken over by a dictator and will be invaded. So people do have that sense of democracy that is taken advantage of, and we can't appeal to that. Another thing, too, is you can appeal to people's religious and philosophical background. If you evoke Jesus, who obviously supported nonviolence or peaceful solutions, and if you appeal to the Jewish prophets, Buddha, Hinduism has a wonderful tradition of peaceful solutions, as Gandhi has shown and many other people have shown. Taoism. Socrates probably, well, according to Martin Luther King, the very first example of civil disobedience in European history. And Socrates had a great deal, a great influence in inspiring Martin Luther King that we can be active citizens and correct the government through peaceful protest, through questioning, through challenging certain policies. So, pardon? Yeah, any, any questions at all from anybody? Yes. I just want to know how you uh, got involved in the military. Like, what was your um, motivation to join the military? Well, my father was in the Army for 30 years. He grew up in the Great Depression. He was born in 1925. He had me when he was 56. And he fought in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. And my mother is from Korea. She was in Japan during World War II. She was in Korea during the Korean War. And neither of my parents went to college. They didn't have any money to send me to a, really, a school. And I had really good grades, so West Point's a very good education. Most people go into the military from impoverished backgrounds, from poverty. And you get your education paid for, and 
That's why most people do join the military. So. Well, I wonder if you comment on this. There was a statement I read recently that desertions are uh, yeah, tripled in the last right. five years. <coughs> right. Well, I'm actually concerned about desertions because the way our military is set up is we're completely subservient to the American people. If the American people aren't sleep asleep at the wheel, military can't do anything. For example, people in the military have limited access to the Bill of Rights. The reason for that is not that we can't speak against war, but so that we can't speak for war. So for example, if the American people, and it is up to them, decide that we should leave Iraq, General Petraeus can't say, well, no, we should stay. This is a bad decision. Or in the 1970s, uh, General couldn't have said, well, let's invade the Soviet Union. So it's actually a good system right now, if the American people take charge. But what's happening is the military is becoming more and more privatized. Right now you have civilians in Iraq with weapons. And I, I really think that if we had 10,000 soldiers refuse to fight, you'd have all those positions filled by government contractors and we'd never get them back. And people someday might go, remember the good old days when the military was subservient to the American people, now it's owned by Coca-Cola. So I really think that the American people can do anything, which, is to, which we have a lot of evidence for that. It's just not, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's fine. What I wanted to know about democracy being your solution, um, kind of what happens when the majority want more, <coughs> or when the majority vote for some kind of like democratic <coughs> thing that we would see as maybe negative? Well, if you look at people, really don't want war. For example, if you look at the Iraq War, the appeal was, well, imminent destruction. We're going to be annihilated. Con uh, the National Security Advisor at the time, Condoleezza Rice, said. We don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. He's developing nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction, and then links to Al-Qaeda September 11th. And we had the appeal to, well, the poor Iraqi people are under a dictator. We're trying to liberate the Iraqi people. And so what people didn't really want was war. The way everything was phrased is people want survival. They just, if you think your family is going to be annihilated by a nuclear weapon, people really want survival. We're at a point in American history. The Roman Empire, the British Empire, they could just say, well, we're going to, for example, Cato the Elder in the Roman Empire, whenever he would end a speech, he would say, Carthage must be destroyed. And when the Romans invaded Carthage, they killed every man, woman, and child, destroyed all the buildings, and sowed the ground with salt so nothing would ever grow there again. The British Empire would just say, well, we're going to use these people for economic gain. But in our country, if we were to say, well, we're going to invade this country for economic gain, the American people wouldn't stand for it. So you have to have this appeal of imminent destruction. We're liberating poor, oppressed people. That's the only way you can convince the American people to go to war. And it, which says something very good about the American consciousness right now is that we don't really want war, we just want survival. And we want people to be also accessible to democracy. So, sorry, go ahead. Pardon? It is, thanks. Okay, sure. <laughs> well, I think the, oh, go ahead. <coughs> You, can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah but you should repeat the question. So. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, so, I, I have a question. Sure. And I'm, I'm a little bit confused about with the terminology that you're saying the people can object to that, but yet then if we say, that if the government has to say about the right, we want to free these people and want to bring democracy to them. However, it's a, it's a big mess, and I think it was a big mess right from the beginning before we <laughs> went there. you're asking if, um, just to rephrase the question. Um, That's yeah. <laughs> I think we all know what you're feeling. Yeah, I, I could. The fact that we're not a real democracy. Well, we weren't a real democracy 200 years ago. A real democracy 
isn't what I would call a country where only white people have privilege. But we have become far closer to a real democracy through peaceful democratic solutions. And we can keep going in that way. So I'm not under the illusion that we're this perfect government. But within that government, we have a system where we can make things better and approach the ideal of democracy. So 100 years ago, we were closer to a democracy than we were 200 years ago, because at least we didn't have slaves. Now we're closer to a democracy than we were 100 years ago, because, for example, women can vote. And so 100 years from now, we might be even closer to being a democracy, a real democracy. So democracy is really a gray area, and we need to go along that line. And in our country, the thing about democracy is in a dictatorship, you're on auto autopilot. You don't have to do anything. But democracy, you have to drive the vehicle. So the American people have to be at the wheel driving. And if you fall asleep at the wheel, then it can quickly not become a democracy. Go ahead. Well, in a democracy, we need questioning. Even if we're going to fight Hitler, we need to question, even if we're going to participate in the most just war you can imagine. We need questioning. We need discussion. We need people debating. We need people conversing, dialoguing. That's what democracy is about. Democ democracy is about people dialoguing, discussing, and not just pulling out swords and killing each other. Oh, go ahead. Right. Well, if you look historically, empire always marks the, the destruction of a democracy. If you look at Athens, if you look at the Romans. And democracy and empire cannot be compatible because with democracy, you have that debate, you have that dialogue, you have that civil struggle. And democracies don't lead to war. Lack of democracy does lead to war because in a democracy, it could lead to war, but it's up to the people whether they want war. And in most situations, in a real democracy, for example, in ancient Athens, if all the public is going to actually be involved in fighting, they're all going to get killed. And so they take war very seriously. If all the Athenian citizens are going to go fight, they go, well, wait a minute. Should we actually be doing this because all our husbands and all our sons are going to be killed? Is this actually a good idea to go to war? All the men might be dead in our city-state. So in an actual democracy, it's actually anti-empire. Oh, go ahead. I think what Carrie was saying, Paul, is that not only is democracy, imperialism not compatible, but democracy and violence. Democracy and violence are compatible? Are not compatible. Oh, right. I, I not have a democracy that says we don't use violence. Right. Or to oppress the people, or to shut down protests, or to so break up a, yeah. Right. Uh, well, I agree completely. Oh, you, you had a question? I was wondering about, uh, you were talking about conversion and this case of being able to generate the political conflict and that satisfies the object. Right. Uh, and I, yeah, I really wonder about that. I feel like, like, like even if there isn't going to be some wrong statement, I think if you're saying the subservient to the reason to the pleasure, I think like really we have the subservient to the heart, which is our view of the heart of this. And like killing people is probably Well, um, like there can't be a war if we do like <laughs> Right. Well, there also can't be a war if the American people don't let the war happen. And nowadays, I think we can have a war with very few soldiers because if you look at the way things are being privatized, it's so profitable for companies like Blackwater and KBR to have people in Iraq. 
when people complain about the cost of the war, it's actually cheaper to have contractors and soldiers because contractors typically don't get any health care, their family don't get any health benefits, and they don't need all that training that soldiers do. And people complain about dead soldiers, but no one counts dead contractors. So when you, there's all this public outcry about, oh, 3,000 dead, dead soldiers, if you had more contractors, there'd be less opposition to the war. So there's a lot of forces pushing for more privatization of the military. And there's generals complaining about, the, oh, my army's too small, I don't have enough people, I need more support personnel, and there's plenty of contractors looking to fill that gap. So times are really changing. It seems to me like, like you're really well spoken and very impressed. Like if you were to like, like cut this tape and like go big, like you could totally like be <laughs> like, right. like, like seriously, like I'm ready for you to like. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. Right? That's the point of the book and yeah. the point of the book. And I've interacted with Michael Nagler and Michael Lerner and Daniel Ellsberg and I've been, I came here to meet my publisher. And so meet like they should like, Well, I think that, that I think that me staying active duty does put that in the American people because I tell them whenever they ask me if I'm going back to Iraq, I tell them it's up to the American people if I go back, and that kind of puts a human face and really shows what the military is supposed to do and how. Everybody in this room is my civilian master. All of you determine what the military does. So, <laughs> go ahead. I, I would like to hear from you how the American people can do that. Because I agree with you, and I remember <coughs> in March 2003 when the war broke out, we had in Europe millions of people on the streets, but also in the US, in New York, and San Francisco, and many other cities, millions of people on the streets demonstrating against the war. And it didn't help. So, what, what, how can the American Well, I think that through the 90s, after the Cold War, people really believed that you had a term called the end of history, everything was going to be peaceful. And I really think that through the 90s, people were pretty apathetic. People really weren't, uh, they were not involved. So when there's no involvement for a decade, then it's, you know, the lesson from that is if a, a war would end and there's another decade where there's peace, people still have to be actively engaged because you have to maintain peace. It's like a vehicle. You have to do maintenance. You have to preserve it. You can't just say, oh, we've won the peace and everything's fine. And so the American people through the 90s really weren't paying attention. And so, so now, how can we support them now? Can right. <laughs> well, I think that there's a long track record of what people can do. If you look at Martin Luther King, if you look at Susan B. Anthony, if you look at what they wrote, if you look at what Mark Twain did, Henry David Thoreau. I think that the answers are there, but we don't have, there's not enough people to really have an impact. And I have what I call the 10% rule. If you look at civil rights or if you look at women's rights, it didn't come from the majority of the population. It actually came from a small percentage of the population. Martin Luther King didn't win freedom for his people because 90% of the people were in the streets protesting. It was actually, you know, more or less 10% of the population actively engaged. So you don't need everybody. You actually only need a small percentage, but right now, if you look at in the environmental crisis, for example, we're nowhere near 10%. Not yet. But we don't want to believe that we have to have everybody. But also, we don't want to believe that people can just wish for it to happen. We have to be actively engaged. And a very small, active minority has a lot of power. As Carl Jung once said, a million zeros don't add up to one. When a reporter visited Gandhi, uh, he said, how many people do you have to defeat the British Empire? And Gandhi said, well, I have roughly 70, but I think my numbers will drop to 30. And then Gandhi, the reporter looked at him like he was crazy, and Gandhi said, well, I believe in the power of the individual. United individuals, if they're small, but they believe in what they stand for, then they can change even the most powerful empire in the world. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Very, very good question. The way I look at the military, if you look at martial arts in China, if you look at the Shaolin Temple, temple for example, martial arts in China grew, martial arts in China were an outgrowth of Buddhism. They were actually an extension of the principle of nonviolence. So the Buddhist monks believed that 
peace, love, and compassion are the most powerful force in the world. But as a last resort, if a brigand or a raider or a robber breaks into their monastery and tries to kill them, they have to defend themselves. And so the problem is not a Buddhist monk knowing martial arts. If a Buddhist monk knows how to defend himself, being responsible and supporting the ideal of peace, they're not going to go out and wage imperial war. You know, the Shaolin Temple wasn't going into India and trying to conquer things. So the problem is not people knowing self-defense, but the attitude that would prevent violence. So how can we apply that to our own country? Well, if you look at our country, it's already been applied. Our military is completely subservient to civilian authority. And although the founding fathers didn't talk about peace, love, and compassion as the most powerful force in the world, they did talk about democratic values as the most p powerful force in the world, which to me are every bit as noble as peace, love, and compassion. And very similar, actually, to peace, love, and compassion if you look at what democratic ideals are so supposed to support. So we could have a country where democratic ideals, peace, love, compassion guide the country. And the military, I mean, our military is, a lot of money goes into our military. I remember I had a West Point professor. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He was a major. And one day he said, we spend more on our military than in the next 18 countries in the world combined. And we all sat there with blank looks in our face. And he goes, did any of you just hear what I said? Isn't that absurd? But we were more in shock. I mean, that's China, Russia, the NATO countries. And so, as Eisenhower said, when you buy a bomb, you take food away from a child. When you buy an aircraft carrier, you take away a hospital or a school that people could have had. So we need to reorganize the military, make it more efficient. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you, Bob. There is an argument that when a democracy goes to war, it's worse than when another kind of regime goes to war. <coughs> Right. The, the what part? The, responsi the re right. responsibility for it is spread out to the <coughs> that it divides it. Right. Now, what I think what's happened to us is that the, the, the people have been cruel and rash. <coughs> because once the war has started, it's not so easy to stop it. <coughs> Well, you're really pointing to the critical flaw of a democracy. There is one critical flaw of a democracy. When you have a country that values freedom and liberty and prosperity for its people, you can convince citizens, this is most evident in ancient Athens, you can convince them to do extremely brutal things to protect their freedom. So for example, Athens had high art, high philosophy. You had the beginning of science. You had poetry, drama. You had open debate. But they could tell the Athenian people, in order to preserve that, you have to do extremely brutal things overseas and annihilate your enemies. So democracy is actually so valuable to people, you can actually convince them to do those things. And in what we can do today, Iraq is a very difficult situation, extremely difficult. And it would take a long time to discuss a solution where we could it would take an extremely long conversation to talk about that. It's just so complex right now. <coughs> okay. Well, Paul, thank you very oh, much. Oh, thank you. Really thank you, Paul. Are you heading out of town now? Thank you very much. Well, people, that is, uh, that's it for today. Uh, I found that very stimulating. Let's rejoin it a little bit on Thursday and go on with the rest of the stuff.